it is my great pleasure to introduce Chris Matthews. He's a political commentator and the host of MSNBC's Hardball, where we count on him to challenge his guests and drive those difficult political conversations. He is the author of eight books, including an acclaimed biography, Jack Kennedy, Elusive Hero. His new book, Bobby Kennedy, A Raging Spirit, looks at the brilliant younger brother, Jack Often Overshadowed. Bobby Kennedy occupies an important place in American political history. His sense of justice and his remarkable ability to connect with and unify people make him a compelling figure for discussion and one whose qualities are increasingly rare today. Please join me now in welcoming Chris Matthews to Politics and Prose. It's always an honor to come here. Um, ever since uh, it was Carla and it was Barbara who started this wonderful place that just keeps getting better. And of course, uh, Lisa and Brad have kept it on and made it into a bigger place. And now they're extending the, the wharf and all that kind of thing. I'll be going over there. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the actual book. Uh, I wanted it to be beautiful because it's a beautiful story. And I wanted to have, like Jack, I wanted to have the matte cover, that wonderful texture. I wanted it to have a decal edge, that's the sort of raggedy edge, because it gives it a historic sense, because it is a historic book. And the manila color, I'm very big on these things, okay? <laughs> I, I really believe in the book should be beautiful because it's a beautiful story. And I think if you buy it, you'll have a beautiful book. <laughs> okay? Now, my wife Kathleen is here. I have a beautiful wife, of course. There's Kathleen. <laughs> And those of you who live in Maryland know that you missed a chance to make her your congressperson. <laughs> but luckily for Maryland, she's the Democratic Party chairman of, Mar of Maryland. Thank you. The, um, the back of the book is really what I started with in terms of my heart and why I wanted to write this book. Um, it's, a it's a really wonderful photograph. It's almost 3D, and it shows the color the, uh, the later in the day. You can see the time of day, obviously in June late spring, and here's a family of, of white working class people, in fact, not even quite working class, very poor people. You can tell the, the, the wife, apparently the wife looking just dirt poor, the kid all dirty, like we used to be when we were kids, w w spent the summers with our shirts on. The guy obviously had a military background. He's offering a very smart salute. His kid is doing the same, obviously, in his direction, his leadership. And it's the kind of affectionate regard for a patriot that I miss. This is what we miss, I believe. That's my heart talking. The white working class looking up to a Democrat with an affectionate sense of regard for a fellow patriot, which the Kennedys were. Whatever you think of them, they were true American patriots, those kids, not the old man. <laughs> this book has a villain. It has a villain. And maybe it, we need a villain to create good people, but I wanted that. On the front, of course, is what Bobby's known for reaching out in a rather sacrificial way because his brother had been shot in a, in a public situation in Dallas. And just five years later, there he is going through the crowd very much exposed. He knew he was very much exposed. The last chapter is called Sacrifice, or the second to last chapter, because he really knew what he was risking. African-American kids obviously exuberant to see him. In fact, I wanted to put them together, in fact, in the prologue. I did a lot of thinking and work on the, on the, ch the chapter, uh, not just the epigraphs, but the pictures the, the half tones to offer it because there you have a white family very much like the one on the back standing basically very much regimentally in line again very poor kids with their shirts no shirts on poor hard-working father this is a, a real picture of american life american gothic and here exuberant or rather devastate african americans there was thousands of them in baltimore singing spontaneously uh, battle hymn of the republic the day he was his body was taken by i mean these are spontaneous moments and with them, I think, a great statement of loss. I remember that day thinking Jack's death and burial had a certain terrible beauty, to quote Yates, but Bobby was just loss. There was just a sense we lost something that could have been. And I knew in beginning this project that what, the, what had survived the 60s was the spirit of this guy. His spirit survived. And I had no idea how, how much the book would be grabbed up this week. I mean, it made number one on... I can't even mention Amazon, but I just did. 
And, and, and number three on Barnes and Noble, I shouldn't do that. But it's really doing well. It's beating out kids' books even, which is tough. And I think it's because the timing, of course, after all the discussion of the Kennedy papers, the Kennedy files, they came out and didn't really show much. I couldn't get, I stayed up late, I couldn't get much out of them, except I figured out how Jack Ruby got to the, uh, got in the police station that night. He apparently had a deal with the local police. They said he had a good in. He, uh, apparently his nightclub was rather sleazy, but it was protected by the local police. He was in with the cops, so they probably were used to seeing this character hanging around. He was armed, and he's in a police station when they're taking the number one prisoner in the world in the hallway, and he just happens to be standing there with a gun. So I, I figured that little part out, of course, going through the papers. It's about the spirit of this guy, and I really think Raging Spirits, uh, just to write tone for him, uh, he was a guy who was very much made almost like a pearl in an oyster. He, um, he, was, he, ro he rose up in a family that didn't respect him much. He was the runt of the family. The old man was an SOB, treated him, discarded him, basically. He wasn't of use to him. Ja uh, 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 Joseph Jr. was of use to the old man. He was going to be his, uh, ab his surrogate to become the first Catholic president. Uh, he had a purpose for him, and then he had a purpose for Jack. Jack didn't care about the old man. He kept his distance from him. He couldn't care less about the old man. But it hurt Bobby to be the run of the family. And Bobby tried very hard to overcome his father's resistance, giving up, I believe, his natural sweetness, his natural generosity. He really did care about other people, and the old man would laugh at him when he'd say things like that. I, I care about, and he would say, and somebody at Lemon said, you know, Bobby is so thoughtful, he's so considerate of other people, and the old man said, I don't know where he got that. That's what he was dealing with. And of course, the boys all came over, came up, all but went in the military. One was killed, almost, the other one almost killed, lost for a week in the South Pacific. Bobby got in the military as soon as he could. The makeup for the old man, I'm convinced, the N.A. Semite, the bad guy in the family. They were embarrassed by him. And they all, like my grandmother who came over from Ireland, she had pictures of my father and his two brothers on the wall when I was growing up. The one that was in the South Pacific in Australia, the one that was liberating the camps as a tank commander, and my dad in intelligence in the Navy. And I think it's the same kind of family. That, but in her case, she was patriotic, my grandmother. I don't think Joe was. Uh, so that happened. It was a big part of this story is about how he relates to the father. He had to go become a jock at, with all the negatives of being a jock at, at Harvard, making the varsity, making letter for the old man. And then, of course, being the tough enforcer for his brother. The next person I think that influenced his life was uh, Jack, of course, who he sacrificed everything for. He was starting off as a real good prosecutor in the Justice Department. He was going after civil abuse up in Brooklyn. They thought he had a big case he was working up there. But when his brother said, I need you, he quit all that, quit his career at justice, and went to work to run, run his brother's campaign and became his tough enforcer and got him elected to the Senate. He would not have won that race without Bobby. He was one tough customer. And then he went to work for McCarthy. And that whole period is fascinating to me. I come from the same background. I grew up with a mom who was home when we first got our Admiral TV set, and I could never figure out what mom was watching on TV, these hearings. She was watching the Army McCarthy hearings. And, um, and she wasn't rooting for the Army, I can tell you. I know my mom, Mary Teresa Shields, was rooting for guess who. And uh, Bobby came to realize how bad McCarthy was, and one of his real maturing experiences was to, work, to, fo to love somebody and realize they were the bad guy. And ending up working against him, working against Roy Cohn, who he despised, working against, I don't know, had any feelings for David Shine or whatever, but he didn't like Cohn. And he went to war with him, and then, of course, he wrote the resolution condemning the guy he really liked. And then he stuck with him to the end. He snuck off to the gravesite in Wisconsin, to Appleton. He didn't want anybody to see him. He hid in the car. You'll hear the whole rest of it. Kathleen gave me the whole story. It's an amazing story of a guy who knew the other guy was wrong, but had an affection for him even though he knew and saw him drinking himself to death, which he did at Bethesda, Bethesda Naval Hospital. McCarthy drank himself to death. He wanted it. He spent three years doing it, but he got it done. So that's another relationship I found interesting. His relationship with Roy, Roy, uh, Jimmy Hoffa, fantastic. He loved going after Jimmy Hoffa. He said that was the, the thing he loved most, was going after the bad guy, the crooked labor leader. He believed that Hoffa was destroying the labor movement, it was the huge union back then, the Tapesters. They were the strongest union in the country. They had all the politicians back where Toffee would say, you wouldn't believe the guys I get in this room. He would bring the politicians in. He owned them all. This is right out of The Godfather. And Bobby went after him with everything he had. And, uh, of course, then he went after um, Giancana, The Godfather. And he, of course, made his living killing people and putting it on meat hooks. And Bobby would tease the guy in the, court, in the hearing room. 
he'd say, when Giancana would giggle, he'd say, I thought little girls giggled. He'd say this to a hitman. <laughs> anyway, that gets very complicated because the CIA hires Giancana to, get, to kill Castro. And Bobby kept prosecuting him. The first thing he did was grab Mortimer Kaplan. Mortimer Kaplan was Bobby's law professor at UVA. He taught tax law. I did a, we did a, a commencement ceremony together at Washington College once. And he had also landed on D-Day, which I thought was pretty impressive. I'm introduced later from him. And I said, I've just come on this stage to follow the guy who landed on D-Day. <laughs> and I was in the Peace Corps. It's not exactly the same thing. And, uh, but Kaplan's, by the way, still practicing law down at Thomas Circle. He's got the, his name's on the, part, on the law firm, Mortimer Kaplan with a C. And Kaplan was the guy who joined the uh, Justice Department effort back in 1961 when Bobby became a AG. And he brought him in for one reason. We're going to use the IRS to catch these guys like we caught Capone. We're going to catch the top. And he, went to the top, he wanted the name of every top mafia figure. And they want to have, he wanted a plan to get each one of them, put him in jail. And up in that list was Giancana. Now, the trouble was Giancana had an interest in the case. The old man had brought Giancana in to help with West Virginia. That was a complicating factor financially. Jack was having sex regularly with Giancana's girlfriend, which was complicated. And as I said, the CIA was using him to kill Castro. Meanwhile, Bobby's prosecuting him. It's a complicated life. Who else is interesting? Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson and his relationship with Johnson began back in 1940, according to Robert Cara, where um, Johnson's sitting in the room with FDR when FDR's talking to Joe on the phone, Joe, the ambassador to Britain. Come on back, Joe. We'll have dinner tonight. You bring Rose. We'll have a great time. And then he does an aside to uh, LBJ and says, I'm going to fire the SOB. <laughs> so Johnson dines out on that for years, and Bobby hears about it. So when they finally meet in 1953, when Bobby's having breakfast with, with uh, Joe McCarthy in the Senate cafeteria, and LBJ walks by, Bobby won't shake his hand and, until he finally does. And then Johnson go, talks to George Reedy, his press guy, and says he's still mad about 1940. So that rivalry began in 1940 and never ended. And Johnson kept edging it up, raising the stakes, accusing Jack and his brother of being part of the Nazi thing. They, he never stopped. And also selling thing, t telling things to the public that were true, like Jack had Addison's disease. And of course, Bobby goes nuts about all this stuff. And of course, then we get to the all interesting fight over should he be vice president or not. And Bobby did everything he could to destroy that deal, but he couldn't stop it because Jack wanted to win. Bobby wanted to administer justice. Bobby was into right and wrong. Jack was into winning. Great stuff. It's all in the book. <laughs> I'm giving away too much here. I, um, I love writing about Jack because he was the prince, the sunny prince, who everybody liked to be with. He was the charmer. Uh, Bobby's the soul. When I first worked on Capitol Hill, after coming back from Africa in the Peace Corps, I uh, couldn't get a job. I, kn I knocked on doors like a lot of people who have done to get a job and starting in Washington. And one of the, the first job I got was working for Senator Frank Moss of Utah, a great old liberal, great guy. And the job I got was to work at night as a Capitol cop and daytime in the office, answering mail and writing little speeches. And so I used to hang around a lot at night. I had my 38 and I had my uniform. <laughs> they didn't trust us completely with the gun. They gave us five bullets in case we tripped. They, they didn't want to have one ready to go off. There was a lot of confidence they had in patronage cops. But Harry, Harry Reid was one, and Mike Barnacle was one. A lot of us were, were capital cops. And, uh, the, um, what I learned were a couple of things, which I, I think there are mortal memories that I kept all these years. And one of them was, this is during the 60s, of course, back in 1970, was still the 60s culturally, and we're fighting over the big demonstrations here, and they would come to the moratorium, and all the demonstrations were going on, and of course, it was the hard hats against the long hairs, the whole thing, and the country people against the city people. We know all this. Fathers against sons. It was horrible. And um, a country boy named Leroy Taylor took me aside, a West Virginia guy, a real country boy, and I was the college kid, and he said, I want to teach you something. You know why the little man loves his country? Because it's all he's got. I try to remember that. I try to remember why there's this cultural divide, the deep cultural divide gut patriotism of the guy from the country who doesn't have anything. And the second thing I found out standing around was I used to hang out with the building engineer. The guy was the super. If something went wrong in the Capitol, he fixed it. And he told me about senators and how they truly behaved. 
He said all the liberal senators were fine, but there was only one of them that said hello to the cops. That was Bobby. <laughs> and I said, well, I like that for about 5,000 reasons, starting with the fact, class, that he wasn't some snotty aristo who liked people in general, but nobody in particular. And also that he liked cops. And I found out from Jack Newfield and people, I've read all the books on Bobby. He loved, he said, cops and waitresses and firefighters are my people. And although he was great for minorities, he didn't skip over the white people who are working class people to get to them. He said, I'm going to include them all. I'm going to make an effort. And that's what I liked about him. He made an effort. Today we have a president who makes an effort to divide. He does it every day. He gets up at 6.30 in the morning and begins dividing. Bobby made an effort. When you have to go before a black crowd and tell them King, Dr. King is dead, and you have to walk into a really scary neighborhood, a white guy, stand on a flatbed truck when the police refused to go in with you. The cops left him. And he had to go tell the people there that the hero of all time had been shot. Just go look at the tape and see who else could have done that. He had moral authority. And I think that's worth reading the book about. And I think he had empathy. This president can't even call up somebody and say, I'm, I'm sorry that your husband was killed. That's not too hard to do. And Bobby had to tell African Americans Martin Luther King has been killed. And he could do it because he did have a heart. And what else? I think he had the ability to unify because he simply said, we have to make an effort. If you go listen to that speech, the great line is nobody knows how to do it. Nobody knows how to heal the division of this country between black and white. Nobody knows how to do it because it's the history of slavery and 250 years of slavery and 100 years of Jim Crow and 100 years of whatever we've had since or 50 years of what we've had since. Nobody knows how to get over that history. And it's especially true among African-Americans and white people because if we've got the whole sense of guilt and anger and everything else mixed in, Sometimes if you come from the islands or you come from Africa, you don't have that. I think that's one reason why Barack Obama didn't have that, 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 that friction that just seems to lie there all the time. And Trump plays it like a banjo and uh, started it with birtherism, saying the first African-American president was an illegal alien who actually was a Manchurian candidate because no one knew him at school. No one knew him at school. What was Trump up to with that line? No one knew him at school. He was trying to kill the idea that we did elect African-American president, kill the idea for the racist that we could say to ourselves, he doesn't really belong. He's a, put an asterisk next to him. He's not really on that list of presidents. That's what Trump was telling the real bad people. And, that, and that's when he built his base of 20 percent. He started with that. And Bobby started, you know, just the, I think he's the un-Trump. And that's why I'm so glad to have written this book. He's the un-Trump. And I think we, and I, I, I think the, um, the spirit, and I'll say this again, the spirit of the guy lives because if you talk to anybody my age or a little younger, they'll say the Kennedy they really connected with was Bobby. And, he, and I was in a peace school with guys like that. I mean, I was rooting for Gene McCarthy like a lot of us. But when it came clear we had to get one of these guys, I, I was praying for Bobby right at the end. We needed Bobby. Gene wasn't going to get elected like president. And who knows who would have won that race anyway. That race was tough. The establishment, the, the, the political machines were... Jim Tate, Dick Daly, they were all with Humphrey, the hump. I never could understand why somebody my age would be for the hump, but uh, I did vote for him in, in November. I wasn't a holdout. I did do the right thing. But actually, I thought Nixon would get us out of the war. What did I know? I thought he'd just say, it's their war, I'm getting out. The trouble was he hired Kissinger, who's worse than Nixon. He really is worse than Nixon. <laughs> and uh, just remember what we saw with the, um, with the, NP with the national with public television uh, documentary on Vietnam. Horrible stuff. Horrible. Conniving. Killing American GI so they could have another term. Anyway, Bobby did make his decision on the war, which you all remember. In the February of 1966, he came out and said, this war is not winnable. And it became clear in Tet, in January of 1968, um, became clear to all of us that if they needed 500,000 troops weren't going to do it, and then Westmoreland said, how about another 200,006? What are you, crazy? Do you think 200 more are going to do it? Nobody thinks that. Nobody th believed at that point. But generally, the public was still caught up in the war. They wanted to stick with it. And Bobby came out and said, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody because I was for this war, and we were wrong. And then there's a great bit in the book where Cronkite comes to uh, Bobby secretly and says, you've got to run. Of course, Cronkite denied all that, but he did do it. And journalists aren't supposed to do it, but he did it because Cronkite cared more about the country than probably anybody at that point, and he was willing to say it couldn't be won. 
So it's a great, I think, in foreign policy and domestic policy and just being American, I think Bobby offers us a, a revival of our spirit. I think it's a tonic, this book. I think it will remind our kids and grandkids that there was such an American who understood that Americanism is not division. It's not taking 40% of the country and running it against the rest day in and day out and building your political career on taking a smaller slice than half the country but knowing you might be able to win again with the Electoral College the way it is. And that's what this guy's doing. Bobby said, I'm going to risk uniting us. So I'll be glad to take questions. I would like to focus on the book, but... I also don't want to give it away. <laughs> so uh, why don't we start? Uh, is there a system here? All right, thank you all. We can start right over here. Thank and you. Back Up, and let's go. Let's fire away. So where did Bobby's sense of moral justice come from? Can you tell a story that had impact on that? Well, you know, when you're that less favored kid at home, maybe some people are, were. I do believe Wordsworth was right. The child is the father of the man. I do believe that, and I believe that if you feel that you're the unfavored kid, the favored kid never has to resort to justice. The, the favored kid never has to say that's not fair. But the unfavored kid has to always go to the courts and say, Dad, be honest, be fair with me. So Bobby was the unfavored kid, and he had a constant call for fairness. I think that's where it came from, personal experience. And I don't think you ever overcome that. I think you know what it was like to be the runt in the family. The one the father wasn't interested, and you had to go. He had to do things like say, "Dad, can't you write letters like to me like you do to my brothers?" That's pretty sad. I think he knew what it was like to be small, and overlooked. Yeah. yeah. Uh, congratulations on the book. I look forward to reading it. Uh, I worked on the Kennedy campaign, much Good. to the uh, detriment of my friends who were all McCarthyites at that time. <laughs> Well, you hung uh, out with intellectuals. Uh, That's your I'm problem. I'm also a, a documentary making. I'm making one on the assassination of Kennedy as, a, as the real turning point of the 60s. Which uh, one? Uh, Bobby Kennedy's. Yeah. As even more than the Martin first Luther act King of Middies terrorism. JFK's. First act of Middies terrorism in this country. That it was the turn away from liberalism, a slow slide to the right. For even now, the Democrats act like Eisenhower Republicans, and the Republicans are way off to the on the right. Anyway. Uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And also, the, the uh, congratulations. I mean, the energy it takes to write your books with what you do is just phenomenal. I know. So Isn't it crazy? I, the wife like, behind me there notices it, too. She yeah, thinks I'm insane. She, and she's I, a Sorensen, right? She she's calls a, it that room. She's a Ted Sorensen. <laughs> you're in that room. Anyway, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I've got to ask you this because you're here. Is this a question? This is a question. This is a question. Could you please explain or justify, knowing your own stances from watching Hardball, NB MSNBC's and your show's particular uh, use of putting Trump on endlessly during the Republican uh, primaries to well, a point of 10 to 1. Because he was, he was winning. Is it, was it, was but he was winning. He was the dominant well, figure. He was the dominant news. Were you going to put on Jeb? Give, no, you no give really, a, really. Marco, <laughs> none of these people had were grabbing the support of the Republican electorate. And you may not like it, but right now, four out of five Republicans support Trump. They just do. But the, but he's the president gave, of the United gave, States. You, gave you don't like speeches. his politics, no, so you say matter. don't cover him. You gave full speeches, unedited, Oh, not, not no, We did not. No, you didn't watch. We were in and out of those speeches. We would go in and out. Well, we, okay. I, I, all I know is I got a producer in New York, and we said we're going to dig in. If he says something interesting, we'll pick it up. If not, we'll drop it. We'll drop it. I watch Hardball all the time, by the way. I'm a big fan. But I remember throwing things at the TV set, watching during the whole okay. Republican well, things, and the general election. How's, how's your TV doing? <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty dented. Okay, I, anyway, I appreciate your so concern. You just, anyway. It was always a question we had when to cover and when to not. But it was the nature of that primary. And if you go back and cover history, if you write about history, you write about Trump. It's just a fact. But you got a point. I don't think we promoted him. I think he was very clever in his use of craziness and making himself interesting and throwing bombs all the time. He gets up in the morning at 6.30 and he goes on Twitter, and that's the news of the day. And it yeah, just is without rating, our help. It's a and he goes, no, he goes on Fox and Friends, and then he goes on Hannity. Now he goes on Laura Ingram. He goes on where they'll take him. I also took him apart one night, and I thought I'd destroyed him. I thought I had. And it didn't work. I thought I exposed him for who he was, a guy who knew nothing. And, I, and it, it didn't bother his – you don't like it because the, the people are so angry at the political establishment of this country right now, they're going to vote – they're going to stick with the guy. And I'm telling you, all he wants to do is hold his 40 percent and run against the other person who comes up against it, beat the hell out of that person, and get his 42 or 3 that it takes to win the Electoral College. That's his plan. 
And, you know, he can say we're not going to cover him. I'm not like David Broder who says, I'm never going to write about Richard Nixon again. It is, I don't believe in that Kremlin wall approach. You don't write about people you don't like. I cover them. You know, so give me a Democrat or somebody who was as, who was as explosive a political force in our country as Trump was last year. Give me one. Do you think Hillary was exciting as a candidate? Was she a good candidate? Did we miss something? I think mediocre, but I do think if you added Would we have minutes, covered her more? I do you think if we covered think her more, she would have beaten from Trump? The beginning, if uh, we had covered her more, more coverage of Hillary, wouldn't she have won? I think by that time the, 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 the goose was cooked. If we gave more coverage to Jeb or Marco or, or, or Kasich, That's a, I like Kasich. I must have, we all love Kasich, but and Chris, it didn't do him any good. You know, we like Colin Powell. We like uh, Mario Cuomo. We I, always have our favorites, and they never get anywhere. I want to know the media doesn't yeah, control anyway, this thing. What do you beat Humphrey? So, tell me when the media, and when's the media going to pick mm. somebody we like? The people we like never win, so don't tell me we have so much power. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> you started it. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to shift the direction a little bit here. Thank you. I'm from Massachusetts, so don't blame me, okay? You don't have an accent, though. No, I've been too many places. Okay, That's the problem. thank you. Uh, although I did vote for Nixon in my first presidential election, so. There's nothing wrong with that. Trying to end the war. I, I, thought, I thought he'd end the war. Yeah. I, I, I voted for Humphrey for civil rights reasons and because I liked a Muskie. But I thought Nixon, the trickster, would get us out. He'd just say, Democrat war, I'm out of here. Yep, so did I. Yeah. What do we know, right? Henry, but, Henry the K. But anyway, my question is this. Uh, every day I get asked by different coworkers, how long am I going to do this? I'm in the construction business. Yeah. I'm going to do it as long as I can stand it because I love it. Yeah, I'll bet. And I think you love it too. I do. What you do. I so wish I could do more for construction, by the way, because I think we should rebuild <laughs> this country. Right. And I wish the Democrats would stop fighting tax cuts and start coming out for something positive, like reconnecting this country by rail. Yeah. Lincoln did it. And I don't know why the construction trades aren't demanding the Democrats be for jobs again. Why aren't we building? Lincoln built the uh, Intercontinental Railroad. We, we haven't even matched it since then. Eisenhower built the highway system. I mean... We had the Morrell Act in 63, 1863, built scientific agriculture in the middle of the Civil War, created all the land-grant colleges. Why don't we do anything anymore? I mean, reconnect the country, kill the left coast, right coast, flyover country, bring it all together, make St. Louis a big city again, make Chicago a part of the country again. I would, I have, I would be such a builder if I were president, and I'd say we're going to borrow the money at 2%, and they're going to change this country and stop – peeing around what tax cut i mean stop it it's never going to inspire anybody it's just totally i don't want any of this tax cut i, I assume they're not going to get the 60 votes and i hope they don't get the 60 votes because i don't think it's going to help the country at all but the democrats are, i couldn't believe nancy and chuck the other day with this staff written garbage oh it's a ponzi scheme who wrote that you know <laughs> you gotta this is such cold toast it's it's just nothing these people are so out of it they're just gone you know, I'm sorry. So, so back except for the Democratic Party chairman so back of, to the <laughs> of Maryland. So back to the question: How long are you going to do this, and are we going to be able to enjoy um, watching you? Uh, uh, I got another contract coming up next May. Um, I, I actually love it. Good. You got me figured out. Good. And Diane Feinstein is much older than me, and so is. And so is Pat Leahy, and so is Joe. Joe I think, oh, Joe's running, by the way. I got news for everybody tonight. You heard it here. Joe Biden is running. It's not speculation. He's running. Uh, he's got to do better than he's done in his last campaigns. Uh, he's always looked good at the starting gate, but then he blows it with some stupid gaps or something. But he um, <laughs> might be his time. He will not quit. He's going for it. What? I don't think Hillary's running again. Uh, I mean that. I'm not being sarcastic. I think um, my candidate's still somebody like Sherrod Brown. You know, an Ivy Leaguer without showing it. You know, he, he doesn't act like he went to Yale. He, uh, he's got a gravelly labor union type voice, and he's from Ohio. And if Hillary had picked him as a running mate, I think she could have pulled it out because she would have said, I'm for the Rust Belt. I'm not, I'm not just for the upper income people or the minorities. I'm for the Rust Belt people. And she might have, if she said something like that, I think it would have been powerful. 
powerful stuff. Over here. It only made a little change. She would have won. A few things right. And she'd be president. Just a few things in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Yes, who's, yeah, who's next? Uh, oh, my wife said it's you. Yeah, it's you. Uh, well, I've enjoyed talking to her. She, my question is more personal. My brother was up at MIT and at Boston College, and he worked a lot with Tip O'Neill in the, in the beginning. I was just wondering if you remember him. Edward Kane, an economist. He would have been at Boston College. He was probably there before. I worked for the speaker from, I was AA from 60, from 81 to 87. The whole time Reagan was in with him. Oh, no, he was. But I was, it was no, before was that point. Back in, in the beginning. I didn't make Tip O'Neill who he was. He was already, <laughs> oh, no. he was already Tip O'Neill. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Chris, I've got to thank you because um, I, I first saw the, the book on uh, Morning Joe when you did that interview. When you, you They were the, nice. Yeah, <laughs> Joe and, and Mika were nice that day. They were really <laughs> the back at a book with the with the picture. Yeah, and uh, I was one of those guys. And and you brought a memory that I hadn't hadn't come to my mind for you know many many years. Um, I was 14. We watched the funeral mass from St. Pat's on TV because it was live. And I lived in Edison, New Jersey, and we knew that the train was coming through Edison, New Jersey, and timed it for 45 minutes to get to where I had to be on high ground to see the train go by I had a uh, it was 38 minutes by bike but I timed it perfectly we got there on time and I was so amazed that there were so many people all different types of people um, and uh, we just stood there and it was absolute silence and and people got out of each other's way so they could see it was just that type of environment and when the train started coming uh, some people saluted, some people put, I had my hand on my heart, like, like many others. It was just uh, one way of doing it. And off to my right, somebody, uh, some group of people started singing America the Beautiful. And we all joined in. It was just one fantastic moment. My, my, that, that's my memory, so thank yeah, you for well bringing it to my mind. Steve but Colbert was talking about that the other night on, my, on his show. He was so uh, uh, emotional about, about that memory. Um, he, he, keep, he keeps on his desk a little glass uh like ashtray i guess and it, it's really the, the words from the cape town speech yeah yeah do you think that they um i know they they had the train come through so uh, if anybody wanted to see it but do you think that they uh, that the family actually thought that the turnout of the people would would be uh, so much love i don't know if they did i know i know they uh somebody's making a movie of the view from the train about what it looks like on the, along the line. You know, a couple of people were killed, remember? Yeah. They, were ju they had gotten out in front of the tracks. I know one th uh, a guy who works for Amtrak told me, they I haven't gone to see it yet, but they've got the train car somewhere in North Philly. It's around, they've kept it on a side rail somewhere. Um, I do think it's what happened with Lincoln, with the train. But the train is kind of a different, different than a plane. That's why I love trains, but it's, uh, there's something about a train that just uh, grabs you, yeah. you know. Thank you. That's what we grew up with, the idea of the trains across the West, and uh, there's something about them, you know. Thank you. Planes don't have it. <laughs> hey, yes, sir. Uh, thanks for Hardball. Looking forward to reading the book. Thank you. I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. My <laughs> uncles were union mechanics, union electricians. Many of them served in the military. When I grew up, uh, my best friends' dads were, you know, mechanics, electricians. Those were the kind of Americans I grew up with. They all voted Dem. Now, they all vote Trump. Most of them did. Yeah. So y you, you've talked a lot about the spirit of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, so I was curious to hear you describe what you think the spirit of the Democratic Party is today and why those people that I grew up with who voted Dem don't see something in the spirit of the Democratic Party enough to vote for him? Well, look, there's no magic formula to winning them back if you're a Democrat, but it's got to be done. It's essential. They will not win elections until they bring those people back. And all the Democratic insiders that love, all the demographic change will eventually win for us. The hell with them. What an awful way of looking at things. We're just, the country will change ethnically, therefore we'll win eventually. Come on. You dance with the one that brought you. People don't like being di people don't mind being used, but they damn well mind being discarded. And if you discard people, you discard the next group when that time comes. 
I really think it comes down to uh, some of it. Look, I think it's Hollywood to some extent. I really do blame Norman Lear. I blame Archie Bunker. The whole idea when the country was told the bottom of the line people in Hollywood, they're the ones that aren't the stars. They just get paid salaries, you know. They, don't, they look down on those people in Hollywood. They're, they're just cost. They're overhead. And all of a sudden, Archie Bunker's the bad guy. Oh, that's a lot of fun. Meathead's the smart guy. I get it. I get it. Got a, a couple advanced degrees living in his father-in-law's house and living off him, living upstairs with his daughter. Uh, come on. You're supposed to root for Meathead? And Rob Reiner's a good guy, but the message was working class people are, are below us. And if Hillary gets caught saying people that, uh, I'm sorry, my hero Obama said people that resort to their guns and they cling to their guns and their religion, they cling to their religion. Let's make fun of people's religion. That's going to win them back. Make fun of people to go to church. And then Hillary refers to a bunch of them as deplorables. Okay, maybe it was distorted, but she sent the signal that that's maybe what she thought. Too much hanging around with your contributors. Too much social life with the people giving your money. Because they don't care about jobs and minimum wage and trade issues. They, they care about a cultural issue here and there. But you know what? They don't care about the working class people issues. And a lot of it's, you know, when choice became an issue. I've been pro-choice in 74, but it's become a dividing thing. And, and it's becomes the spear point of It shouldn't be the divider in politics. I didn't allow a little debate over that. I think we're going to stay a, a pro-choice country. And I think some of these the bathroom issues, they don't help. You know, I think the Democrats just jumped... They focus too much on them, and it's, it's called politics. Learn what to focus on. Focus on what unites, not what divides, and find a way to keep uh, the economic issues out front. I don't know what the Democratic economic program is now. I don't know what they stand for. Why don't I know? I do it for a living. I don't, I've, someone always told me. What was their platform in 2016 on economics? What was it? How are they going to rebuild the industrial part of the country, re back, bring back manufacturing, or replace manufacturing, or something? And uh, Trump came along with his, you know, his nonsense. I'm going to, what? I don't know what he's going to do. Build a wall, and, you know. Uh, and he had something. He said a plan. It was a wall. <laughs> and the Democrats didn't have anything. Look, I think um, elitism got into the Democratic Party because the people who pay the money are elite. And they hung around with the Hollywood crowd, and, and it's a winner's circle. It was a party people weren't invited to. And they said, okay, I can't compete with that. They should have been more Springsteen. A little more Springsteen, a less elite, you know. But that's it. It worked. The Republicans did the same thing, but for some reason they got beaten first in the last spring. So the Romney types, who say 47 percent, they paid the price first. Just remember, it wasn't just the Democrats who were beaten last year. It was the Republicans. They were beaten first. Trump beat them, and in this sort of canine way Republicans behave, they accepted the, their victor as their new leader. And now they all disagree with him on all the issues. And that once he's in, they go, OK, 80 percent for him. It's Democrats, I have to say, the one good thing about Democrats is they're not like that. <laughs> they don't go along with the latest leader. <laughs> I can tell you, Democrats know how to divide and fight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Bernie people weren't going to go with Hillary that much. The Gene McCarthy people weren't going to go with uh, Humphrey and Bobby people weren't going to go. And uh, the Teddy people weren't going to go with Carter. I know that. And that always is a problem. But the Republicans are like penguins. They are. I wish I could answer the question. Could it, I think it's the key question for the Democratic Party. If you can't unite people on economic issues, you're not a good political party. You got to do it. And as Bobby said, you have to make an effort. I think they may have got the message that maybe Sherrod Brown, maybe Amy Klobuchar, maybe somebody from the Midwest, someone like that may be the candidate next time. And uh, maybe it's Joe Biden. He's old. But he, I think he gets it. He would call me up once in a while and say, you get it, you get it. <laughs> you know, I mean, he knows the whole Scranton thing is not a pose. I mean, that's who he is, you know. He's the guy, you know. He wasn't in, into the 60s. He was just Joe, Joe uh, Biden, Uncle Grandpa Finnegan and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Where's so my wife? Are you there, Kath? I'm over here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> It's my okay. number one audience. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I actually do watch Hardball all the time. Used to time my walks around it. Now with the DVR, I don't have to. And I vote in Pennsylvania, but I, vote, I tra traveled 200 miles to vote, and it certainly wasn't for Trump. So now a Hardball question. Trump has appointed um, two of his family 
How is this different from JFK and nepotism supporting? What do you think is the difference? I don't know. Uh, give I'm us some thought. You, no, you, give us some thought. What do you think is the difference between picking a, a well, nitwit who's never done anything and a guy who got him elected to the Senate, got him elected to the presidency, ran the rackets committee for all those years fighting the bad guys, knew the law, knew what he was doing, was a public servant, had started off with the Justice Department, but he just got out of law school, actually had a career. And then he picks this member of the Romanov family, and, and, and somehow that's the same thing. And by the way, what's the name of the Justice Department, madam? DOJ. No, what's its name? Department of Justice. It's the, it's the Robert F. Kennedy building. I guess he did a good job. Well, no, I'm not saying he didn't. Well, that's I, my I, point. I, I am not arguing What's your point? I'm you. sorry, what's your point? My point is, what's the difference between... The difference is quality and lack of quality. The but guy isn't prepared. I think, the, I think, by the way, big predictor here, I think Trump's going to get rid of the guy. I well, think he's going to be sent back to New York. That. I yeah. think he's... I hear... From subterranean sources that he wants that he's not a big friend of him he, he doesn't think his family's been straight and it, it's the family he's blaming now yeah there's some the, well, we know the family the Kushners we know the situation I'm not going into it we all know it and I think he's decided that it's a problem he still likes Ivanka I think okay but why is she always on the plane? He does behave like a royal family or an NBA player you got to bring the entourage wherever you go What's with the entourage? Well, Why I, is he so insecure? He needs to have his daughter, his son-in-law, his wife there all the time. And what, I don't get it. And his son, he had his son around for a while. Why does he need the entourage? Well, I, I, because he, he thinks it's an asset. He thinks it's an acquisition. He, he thinks the presidency is an acquisition that his family now owns. And that's how he talked about the uh, Justice Department the other day. Why can't I tell the FBI what to do? Yeah. How come I can't tell the... No. Jesus. When, whenever if Nixon could call up Mark Felt and tell him what to do, there wouldn't have been a Watergate investigation. <laughs> He'd say, Mark, I don't do it. Leave me alone. No. That's what Nixon no. could have killed the Watergate problem. Hey, Mark, drop it. That's, this guy actually thinks like that. Kathy and I saw the movie's not great, but it's very educational. It, it actually was. About the institutional yeah. integrity of the, of, the, of the FBI. They don't like people like John Dean coming over and telling them what to do. So I'm not sure you answered my question, but I... <laughs> My answer is, Bobby Kennedy was his brother, yeah, well, and he was qualified. Nepotism. That's still nepotism. That was my big, that was actually the basis of my question. I agree with you. That is still Generally, nepotism. I agree with you. Okay. That's all I want. No. But I all, I I all rules that. have wonderful exceptions. That's all I'm saying. Thank you very much. You're tough. Thank you. So I want to I plug your book for a minute, for those who haven't read it. I love the story about uh, how Joe Kennedy was the first Irishman to be driven out of Boston on his own private train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't have a hard life, did he? Uh, but uh, but, uh, but wherever Bobby went, he would tell the story. I mean, he did it all the time. He, when he went to Scranton right after his brother was killed, he kept talking about how horrible the Irish were treated. Blah blah. My mom was like this. Oh, the, don't talk to me about civil rights. We were treated just as bad. I heard that the whole time growing up. Look. Um, uh, Bobby believed that stuff. He loved that legacy that, that he was one of the downtrodden people in this country. It was very important, I think, to his way of becoming an identifier with people in trouble, black people, African-Americans, Chicanos, as we called them back then, California farm workers. I think it helped him, but I, re I really think it was the way he was treated by the old man that made him someone who identified with people who were overlooked and discarded. I think you make the case in the book, and it's nicely done. But I want to talk about a fantasy for a minute. So Tip O'Neill was my first congressman. Thank you for working with him. Thank you for whatever you could have done to help us during the Reagan years to bring more comedy to our government. But what I'm imagining is maybe we'll get lucky. Democratic House, the next midterm election, bear with me a minute. Yeah. Um, Trump maybe gets into enough trouble with his family that he decides to step away. We have a Democratic House that puts a Vice President Pence or President Pence into check. So I'm looking for a silver lining in the dark clouds somehow. So I'm not asking. I don't. I, I'm just oh, they're going to put a Democratic way. vice president in and then get rid of Pence? No, no, no. I, That's I not. Bella had that theory. Bella absolutely wanted to do I, that. I read about that I, one recently. That, I'm not going that far. Okay. But, but what I'm trying to imagine is how the heck do we get out of this situation? Well, uh, first of all, I think there's a good shot. Here's what I think. If you, here's the screwball way politics works. Suppose they pass the tax cut and it includes, gets rid of the. Uh, New York State deduction for property taxes. So if you're living in the city, if you're... The thing is, though, Trump 
is exquisitely evil in this. So what he did is he taking, he's taking away the deduction for property taxes, not for income taxes. So he's helping out his Congress people in upstate New York. So the city people, who probably pay through the roof on property taxes, they can't deduct it. So he's screwing the city while he's helping out upstate. So I thought, I thought you just count the number of Republican members of the House from New York, California, New Jersey, the other high tax states, and you got your pickup. You get the 24 seats you need. It's right there. But I don't think they're going to end up getting that success. I think they may not end up doing it. But you know what? I'll tell you, the problem is it takes about 12 percent or it takes at least 10 percent in the national polling to win the House back. It does because Democrats have domination in big cities, about 90 percent in places like Berkeley, San Francisco, L.A., Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, Philly, New York. They own these seats by 90 percent. They waste all those votes. So when you do a national poll, it doesn't tell you how you're going to crosswalk it to how many seats it's going to be. Because Republicans win seats about 60, 65 at the most, even in Utah. So you can't go by this national poll. And by the way, don't go by the national poll for the presidential next time because forget California and New York. At six million votes, just take them right off because it, in terms of the national number, it doesn't help because, okay, the Democrats win California and New York. Forget about it. But winning the country, the, the 270 electoral votes, you got to go back state by state again. And that's why these national polls were very delusional to people. I mean, I'll tell you, though, in all fairness, Kellyanne Conway called me election night. They had no idea. She's sitting next to Trump. It's 830 at night. They had no idea they're going to win. So it was a surprise. You think you actually won Pennsylvania? Yeah. Well, they polled up there. Susquehanna poll. When they polled with a person on the phone, Hillary won by eight. Same polling company polled with a robocall with a recording. Trump won by two. So instead of recognizing that their polling wasn't working because people weren't admitting they were voting for Trump, they wouldn't admit it. They averaged it out and said Hillary wins by three. This is the phoniness of some polling. They just averaged it out. They don't know who was going to win. Hillary by three. No. Trump by two. And that's what they didn't want to admit. And everybody said, we're going to win. Every, every, I'm talking to Bob Brady, the boss of the city that night. I'm talking to, it was just a big surprise because the polling wasn't honest. Because people weren't honest to the pollsters. Somebody told me in Israel it's the same way where people don't say they're for Bibi. Not because they're not right wing. That's okay in Israel. You can be right wing. You just can't be that lowbrow to be for Bibi. <laughs> and nobody wants to admit they're a lowbrow in Israel. So uh, it's true. <laughs> anyway, thank you. About 20 years ago, Max Kennedy, yeah. uh, Bobby's son, wrote a book uh, published by my publisher, Harcourt Brace, and it was a, a collection of Bobby's essays. I wondered if you were familiar with it. Um, it I remember at the I time think it was on sale at bookstores. I saw it. In the, it was in yeah. the checkout counter. Well, it was I was really shocked by it because it was, it, these were Bobby's writings, and it was, most of them were, were um, tirades about the corporate, corporatization of the country and the warnings about the military-industrial complex. And I just wondered if um, you have any of that, you've included any of that in no, your No, Bobby was more book. complicated than that. Bobby was very much, he didn't like the great society, he didn't like welfare. He was pro-cop. He thought that uh, law and justice should work hand in hand. He, was, he thought that law worked for uh, ending segregation. Law worked against the crooks. Uh, I think he believed in law. For, uh, I don't think he was some you know, lefty radical. I, I think in terms of economics, um, I think he probably didn't like big business, which his father represented. He, um, he was very much for local solutions to local problems. I think he really always tried to figure out local participation. Like, And he also believed with Bedford Stuy that you have to bring corporations in to help local communities develop. You can't just go with government solutions. So I don't think he was a lefty the way we think of that as being anti anti business, pro big government, LBJ stuff. I, I but I also where where he was a radical in terms of his philosophy. He in the end, I got this from Robert Coles, the philosopher, the psychologist up at Harvard, who knew him, and he said that Bobby Dien was trying to figure out why Cesar Chavez and Dorothy Day, the Catholic worker, why the real radical Catholics, what energized them every day to do their thing why they were so energized by their religion. He was, a, he was, try, he was into, you know, um, he's trying to figure this thing out. He, he had read, um, 
you know, the other America by Harrington. He was really a radical Catholic. He wasn't just an older boy Catholic. He was a guy that tried to figure out social philosophy. And so I think he was a radical in that sense, you know. Like but I don't know. I don't know all this. I don't know what Max pulled together. I mean, I, I think I got the major speeches. That ca I think everyone recognized the speech that Adam Walensky worked on, uh, the one in Cape Town. It's maybe the best. It's the one at, at his grave. I think the one in uh, Indianapolis, which he gave from his heart, were the other ones. Um, I don't know. They were so anti-corporate that yeah. I remember being shocked reading well, them. Well, that may be Max. Yeah, thinking, Max a little wild. No, they were actually... No, oh, come on. They were come on, he picked them out, okay? Yeah, but Bobby wrote them, and, and yeah. they were really worth yeah. looking well, at. Well, I'm saying he was a radical in many ways. I, it's, uh -huh. But you can't, you got to look at the whole picture with Bobby. He doesn't fit the mold of, you know, like Bernie or somebody today. He doesn't fit that simple mold, you know? That's why he's fascinating to figure out, you know? Just remember, he was, he was after Castro, too. He didn't like communists. It's all real. Good evening. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you. A uh, two-part question. I haven't read the book yet. I'm going to read it. It's on I sale can. here. I, I I've, got <laughs> I've got four copies. It's really, you know, it's interesting. Can I talk to you about this deal? <laughs> it's such a deal. Uh, $28.99, not $29. This may make a difference for your decision. $28.99. And if you're a Canadian... It's thirty-eight ninety-nine, but, but that's a better deal on the trade. I've already purchased four. I love you already. Let's go. I want to get this. <laughs> so two things, a two-part question. The reason I said I haven't read the book yet, I know you know. I remember the quote. He just about he finished his speech in L.A., and he said in response to a reporter's question, "I'm going to, I'm going to chase Hubert's ass all over the country." Yeah. So my first question is, I'll ask them together. First question is, please tell us what chance he had to secure the nomination, number one. And number two, I'll ask you to play Jeff Greenfield a little bit. So if he had won, I know, I'm, I know for sure he would have ended the war, but he saved 50, you know, 25,000 mm -hmm. American lives. Yeah, but I believe you're right. Beyond that. What's your sense of what kind of a president? And well, let's start with radical, what we know. Would let's have been too radical to uphold the Congress. Well, let's, let's start with what we know. Two things. That night, when he realized he had won, the uh, numbers had committed up for him, to, and he thought he had won big, which he did. He won by four or five. He thought he was won by eight or ten. He went over to Richard Goodwin, who had been working. He'd been back and forth. Goodwin had worked for uh, Gene. And he said, Gene has done much more than I thought he would do. He finally recognized Gene was a serious Serious, big-time opponent and worthy of respect. Finally, he recognized that after winning in Oregon and really pushing him uh, in California and getting the intellectual, like Jewish votes, smart people. A lot of people, the real academics were for Gene, we all know. I mean, he wanted them back. He needed them. So he said to Goodwin, um, West Side of New York he needed. He, he said, I, will, um, let's get, I want to give uh, Gene Secretary of State, like Jack had offered it to Adlai, to Stevenson. And he said, if he, if he quits now. <laughs> now, come on. The problem was Gene was tough and Gene was stubborn. I interviewed Gene 20 years afterwards and he was still stubborn about that race, still angry about Bobby and the issues he used against him. Um, he uh, would have had to get Gene out of the race because that night he had sat with Dave Hackett, his classmate, who had gotten all the numbers together back in 60 for the delegates, and he, he realized the truth that if they kept splitting the anti-war vote, they weren't going anywhere. It, they'd be lucky if the anti-war vote was as much as the pro-war vote, the Humphrey regular vote. So there just weren't enough votes to share. They had to get uh, Gene, Gene out of the race. And I'm telling you, that's the problem they faced. Gene would have been very strong in New York, the primary that came later. Gene might have knocked him off in New York. Gene was very popular in New York, uh, McCarthy. So I, that's tough, too. Humphrey had Jim Tate in Philly, the mayor. He had the machines. He probably he had Dick Daly. The only thing I say that could have changed it all is as that summer went on and Bobby campaigned and the war looked worse and worse, there might have been something spectacular that happened. I think a, a lot of those delegates were not bound in those days. We didn't have the McGovern rules and all that back then. They weren't bound. If he had walked into that convention hall in Chicago, instead of the knives, I mean, the police riot outside and the craziness went on in Grant Park, instead of that, he had come into the convention. It's chilling to think about Bobby Kennedy walking into that convention like he did in 64. 
and they might have gone wild. And maybe something wild might have happened because there was a chemical connection between the Kennedys and the Democratic Party that Humphrey and Johnson never had, never had. And I'd like to think that the party was dynamic enough to respond to that, but who knows. And as for his presidency, he did scare people because they knew he meant what he said. And I think that's something that politicians uh, rarely have to deal with, that people believe them. <laughs> and uh, Nixon, if you, there's a part in the book, why am I giving this away? Anyway, <laughs> there's a part in the book where Nixon is watching Kennedy announce on March 16th of 1968 from the caucus room. And he's watching the TV. He's out in, Nor out in Oregon at the Benson Hotel, and he's pretty much wrapped up the nomination for the Republican side. Of course, he lost to Jack in a race that was very close. And he probably figured it, it should have been his in a lot of ways. And he's watching the TV. He watches Kennedy give his speech. Somebody turns off the TV set, and Nixon's still staring at the screen, like in a movie. Like, nobody does this in real life, but <laughs> Nixon's staring at the screen, and he has this spooky reaction, like there will be forces unleashed now that we cannot imagine. And this is going to end in some heart... It's just like Denholm Elliott in Indiana Jones. You know, it's like you know, the power of the Ark of the Covenant, kind of weird, weird moment there. And uh, so we don't know. Uh, the segregationists resented Bobby. The mob resented Bobby. Um, some of the crooked unions resented him. Some of the clean unions resented him because he was so tough on the crooks. And um, it would have been electric. But he had a Democratic Congress, and he would have done a lot. He would have had a real strong Democratic uh, uh, majority in both houses. And this is at the time when the Democratic Party still was the dominant political party in the country. We did, the party didn't lose that until much later. And he could have done things. So it would have been something. But the war would have ended, and that would have changed everything. That war, uh, he had to bring in the, um, the, the, the Liberation Front, the, the political wing of the BC, had to bring him in. Because eventually we gave it all to them anyway. We walked out. So just give us our POWs. We're leaving. Why? They could have made that deal in 69 in January. We'll leave if you give us our prisoners back. They could have. We could have had that deal. What, what was peace with honor? We're leaving. Anyway, doesn't everybody remember that? That Nixon got the same deal at the end he could have gotten in the beginning? Except all those guys are on the, half the wall was built. The Vietnam Wall has been built because of that awful absurdity of we have to win the war to get reelected. Anyway, this has been great. Um, yes, one more. Yeah, uh, Two more. thank you so much. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, getting the book as a Christmas present for my uh, mother, and because uh, she was big, you know, um, she was big in local and democratic politics at the time. And actually, I remember um, we had met almost six years ago. I was a lot shorter then; I couldn't vote yet, and we were in Chicago. And you were on an early morning flight on your way to cover the Iowa caucuses. The only interesting race was on the Republican side. And I would uh, wanted to ask you um, how close, you know, you thought. Uh, that was 92, right? Uh, to 2012, 2012, 2012, I mean. 92. Iowa caucuses. When I said a lot shorter. Time flies. Not, not <laughs> that much shorter. Um, not that much shorter. Um, people are corporations. Corporations are people. Right. That was yeah, anyway, are you, uh, are you uh, involved in this conversation already? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, uh, no, I was anyway. I wanted to ask you how close do you think Santorum can can cut it, can get there? And he actually won by twenty seven votes. I even I didn't expect that, but I'd grown up in the Trump country part of Indiana, and I've even gotten to visit the spot in Indianapolis where Bobby Kennedy spoke. And so I've was I right or wrong? Uh, you you were uh, kind of groggy and walked off uh, because we were boarding. We were boarding at the time. Perfectly good I reason. I never walk away from anybody. That's not true. I always talk. You were. I tried to ask you in it, and I uh, tripped over my words a bit. But even I was wrong. And you know, Santorum pulled off a surprise victory with that populism and old folksiness that Romney never quite got to. And I'm wondering. Um, <laughs> The one thing you did Romney say, may try it again. Don't yeah. kill that idea. He's, the he's one gonna, thing he's you did get that Senate yeah. seat in January, next January. We'll see. The one thing you did say when I real uh, was that you, you we looked around and there was a bunch of you know airport noises around and you were headed to Iowa and he said it's a whole different ball game out there, meaning Iowa. And this is where I'm actually getting to my question now that um, <laughs> you've caught up. Sorry, uh, but I what has writing the book taught you about the urban-rural divide and that kind of 
you know, what it thought to be just a romney Santorum divide and is more like a, you know, Trump and everyone else Well, I don't divide. buy the urban world. It, the people in the really? city, uh, yeah. the, there are urban uh, white people, if you will, conservative white people who are just as conservative as this whole Appalachian thing about J.D. Vance. I don't buy that. Uh, you know, what Pennsylvania... In New Jersey, I got brothers who voted for Trump. I mean, not all of them. I get, I think we're about 50-50 in the family. Uh, and surprising, surprising people the way they voted. And I don't think it's this rural hick ar argument. I think that, look at the Collard counties of Philadelphia. They did not go for Hillary the way, that, the whole strategy Hillary had was to get Republican educated women, college educated women to vote for her. Didn't happen. They didn't have, my sister-in-law, Claire Kennedy, the ultimate feminist, voted for Trump. And I called her up and I said, why? And she said, I hate Hillary. I said, why? Where'd that come from? I just hate her. I can't explain it. Where'd that come from? We don't cover that. One, we weren't covering some things in the press. I agree. We didn't cover everything. That, that animosity that was underground showed itself in the election. Now all Democrats, oh, it's Hillary was the worst candidate. Well, they didn't say that before. Nobody said that. She was okay. There's something else was going on. Some real social. And by the way, I believe the level of resentment is growing. And I don't think the Democrats necessarily benefit from every time Trump stubs his toe and makes a fool of himself. They don't go up necessarily. And I don't think that, I think if they count on that, they're making a big mistake if they just lay back. I think the level of resentment against people like uh, Mitch McConnell and the Republican side and those people is growing and it's growing on the Democratic side too. Mm. And we've got people in that party like John, uh, oh God, Conyers has been around forever. I'm sorry, forever. Same old, same old. And Nancy's a very nice person, but enough. It's just not going to work anymore. She's got no more tricks in her pocket. You only have so many tricks in your pocket if you're a politician, maybe 20, 30 years if you're lucky. That's a long haul, too. And she's brilliant. She's smarter than Tip. Better leader than Tip. Better. Tougher. Tougher. And, uh, but Chuck doesn't seem to want to lead the party for whatever reason. Maybe he knows he can't do it. So I'm, I keep asking me who's the leader of the band. Biden. <laughs> Some people think so, but we'll see. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, I look forward to learning more. Uh, it's from all my in mother. there. It's, yeah. it's in those covers. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks and, so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Let's go to the next fellow, and we have to get going here. Thank you, sir. Okay, two questions. One about the book. One about current times. You want me to ask them at the same time, or go ahead? Minute? Okay. First question. I was born in 1967. So I was alive, but not young enough to remember. I graduated from college that year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was alive, but not young enough to remember anything about Bobby Kennedy, obviously. Yeah. But I've read a lot about the 60s, and it's a uh, fascinating time. You've mentioned if he had become president that he would have stopped the war. But what would you tell somebody like me or younger? I, I've I always felt like... The country was robbed of something important when Bobby Kennedy was taken away. I agree. And what kind of legacy do you think he would have left? What would you tell someone that's too young to remember him or born after he was killed about him? Just simply, there was a guy that once said we should make an effort to unify in a patriotic love of our country that's positive, that, that a great country should also be a good country. That a great okay. country should be a good country. That was his legacy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I had made some notes on my phone, but I can remember this question. Easy. Easy to remember. Okay, let's go. Okay. The Republican Party has stuck with Trump. I feel like a lot because uh, they want these tax cuts, and they've been wanting them for so they long. They won't get them. Don't worry about it. Take 60 votes. If it raises the deficit, it takes 60 votes in the Senate, it's not going to happen, okay? Well, but will they turn on him after that? I don't know, but it won't happen.